Hello, I'm Lance Nichols. I'm part of Montana Space Grant Consortium's Borealis program at Montana State University. Um, Borealis is a high altitude ballooning program and I wanted to make a series of videos, um, uh, educational videos, that goes over all of the um, components of Borealis and um, all of our uh, different uh, balloons, um, systems, etc. Um, so to start this off, I wanted to just cover some uh, basic components of ballooning, basic mechanics, um, how ballooning actually works. Um, so in order to uh, make this as concise as possible, I expect you to have a basic physics understanding, um, high school physics one and two, and um, I, just high school chemistry class um, will be sufficient. Uh, this is fairly basic stuff, so if you don't have that, uh, you should be able to understand it. Um, so let's get into it. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Earth's atmosphere. Um, the Earth's atmosphere is uh, what allows the ballooning to actually happen, and it's where the ballooning happens. Um, so the very first component of that, um, which is key to the, um, the balloons operating the, in the way that they do, is that um, gases are compressible fluids. So if we look at this chart here, we can see the atmospheric uh, density and pressure um, in relationship to altitude. Um, so you can see that there's also a log scale here. So the, the density um, and pressure are both decreasing um, in a linear fashion um, on the log scale. Um, so that means they're um, decreasing uh, exponentially. and um, one thing to note here is that the the ballooning uh, happens um, at about you know 30 30 kilometers uh, 100,000 feet or so uh, that's our kind of our ceiling uh, you can go higher than that uh, but it just gets exponentially harder because the um, you know uh, density and pressure are going down and it's you know because of this exponential um, factor um, the 99% uh, 99.9% 99 .9 of the mass is contained inside uh, the troposphere um, and stratosphere so that's right in here um, and 99% is contained um, below uh, 30 uh, kilometers or so so um, we're above most of the atmosphere um, when we're flying um, and then just for a point of reference the ISS is like at 400 and 10 or something so it's it's up here the international space station um all right so the next thing is atmospheric temperature and this is a little interesting um because uh <laughs> because it does not uh follow an intuitive pattern so if we if we just look down here um as you would imagine the higher you go up it gets colder um until you get to a point um here in the uh top of the troposphere, uh, troposphere um, where it actually begins to get warmer again. And this is because of the ozone layer um, absorbing um, those high energy photons and it actually heats up the, uh, heats up the uh, stratosphere uh, quite a bit. Um, and then it's, it's, hard, um, it's hard to say that things are cold or hot um, up in the uh, stratosphere is because the uh, lack of particles, um, the really low densities, um, make conduction uh, severely reduced um, from normal uh, gr uh, ground level um, conditions. So you would imagine, oh, if I was up there, I'd be cold. Um, well, it would take longer um, for you to get cold uh, because there's less particles actually um, conducting that away that heat away from you um, so uh, the radiation from the sun has a uh, very big impact so whether your um, your component or your balloon is um, absorbing um, those those photons it will um, basically dictate whether it's going to get hot or um, basically how fast it's going to get hot <laughs> um, or if it's in the shade um, then it doesn't have an opportunity to get hot and it will only um, decrease uh, and that, that thermal sink uh, will take away um, that heat and I'll talk about more about the thermodynamics later but um, let's move on to our next topic um, so I want to talk about uh, basic balloon statics um, 
so these are just uh, the actual uh, forces and uh, etc. that go into a balloon. So inside um, an ideal balloon, the uh, the pressure is the same on the inside as the outside, and uh, and hopefully that makes sense. Um, the and also the density is the same at the inside and the outside because the uh, the pressure pushes on the outside of the balloon, and the, the pressure on the outside pushes on the uh, envelope of the balloon as well, and uh, those forces will. Uh, cancel out if the balloon is uh, free to take up however much volume it uh, desires, such as like a, um, a party balloon, you know. Um, and then for a latex balloon, these the, uh, the force is um, tangent to the um, tangent to the balloon are acting and the pressure and density are only slightly greater inside the balloon. Um, because of this, um, because of this, these forces that act along the uh, circle, basically trying to shrink it a little bit, um, but for the most part, um, they're they're equal. Uh, they can be treated as equal uh, when you're doing your calculations. Um, but definitely keep that in mind um, as for positive pressure inside of a latex balloon. And there are other types of balloons that have. Uh, uh, these are equal so and I'll talk about those in another video because they're a little more complicated so um, next I want to talk about the uh, pressure volume relationship so here's the ideal gas law um, in condition one right here and then condition two here um, and then I'm assuming that the balloon is not leaking so the amount of uh, gas is remaining the same that's the gas constant is always going to stay the same. And I'm just going to assume the temperature is the same just to make it easy. Um, so we can see that the pressure and volume um, equals pressure and volume. So um, as you go up in altitude, the pressure is going to decrease. So the volume needs to increase in order to make this equal. Um, so this, this basically models all balloons um, as they rise. Basically, balloons are just going to take up more volume if they have the opportunity to because the pressure is decreasing. So now I want to talk about um, these are uh, balloons that have reached a static uh, volume uh, for whatever reason. Maybe the material doesn't stretch any further. Um, basically, we can calculate because um, the volume is the same. Now we've taken out that other constant, and we can calculate what um, what the pressure is going to be, um, and from that pressure, we can go back to that um, chart that I showed you at the beginning, um, showing pressures at altitudes, and uh, we can figure out at what altitude it's going to, uh, what altitude it's going to s float at. It's going to stop going up. So this this models these things: uh, zero pressure, super pressure, um, and or an underfilled latex balloon. Uh, I'll get into all those in another video, but um, that's what it models. So these are the actual forces on the balloon, um, or the the basic forces that is, um, while it's once it's reach and reach neutral buoyancy. Um, so here's the buoyancy equation. You have the force of buoyancy equals the um, density of the air displaced, volume displaced, um, and then the gravitational constant, of course. And then the gravity um, is just equals mg. And then one thing to keep in mind is that that m is the mass of the entire system including the balloon uh, envelope and the mass of the lifting gas and your payloads. So make sure you're um, doing that right. The, the gas inside of your balloon does not weigh nothing, um, so it has mass to it. So your theoretical float is when these uh, two vectors equal each other. And, you, and if you uh, set these equal to each other, the g's cancel out. Um, and you're left with basically what is just looks like the density equation, um, although it's the uh, density of the air um, calculated uh, by the mass of the balloon system, as talked about here, and then the volume displaced. Um, and I'll, I'm going to go into more detail now about that. Um, so basically, we can um, break out what the mass components are. 
so this is the total mass, um, and then so we have the mass of the payload, the mass of the envelope, and the mass of the um, lifting gas. Um, so ideally you have selected some gas that is less dense um, than air so that this mass is not going to um, uh, give you uh, negative buoyancy. So we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Um, so let, if I break this out to the force equation, so I just sub in the M, so I get Mg. Um, and then this is the, uh, the mass of the lifting gas in terms of density. So here's the density of the lifting gas and then the volume of the balloon. Um, so I break those out. And then once again, once again here's our neutral buoyancy, um, Fg equals Fb. And then the other th thing I'm assuming is that um, the volume of the balloon is the is the same as the volume displaced. Um, technically, we are all displacing uh, gas. Like we, as humans, are sitting here. Our volume is displacing gas, and we actually have a buoyant force associated with us. Um, it's just that our uh, you know gravitational force is so much more um, that we do not f begin floating and also that you know we're less we're way more dense in the atmosphere um, and th that will be shown here so if we put all this stuff together cancel out the G's and then move the um, the densities over and uh, make these V's uh, equal you get this equation so this is the uh, neutral buoyancy of an uh, ideal uh, mass balloon um, and and this can be basically applied to any um, balloon. So if your your mass is placed or your um, density of your air um, at whatever altitude uh, you're at, so that's you would plug in if you're trying to figure out. I want to go to this altitude. Plug in your density at that altitude, and then you you know solve for these thing, two things, and then you need to go. Okay, how big of a balloon do I need? Um, and then if you just go. I'm gonna assume that I'm gonna use helium and what is the density of helium at that altitude and then how, how big of a balloon do i need to get to that altitude basically so you can use that to uh, determine that and then so i, I said relative densities here because basically you're subtracting um these two densities uh to get your um your lift so let's say you're using hot air or something for your balloon this is going to be this number here is going to be uh, very small and so you're going to need a huge volume to get to those higher altitudes. Um, and, and this basically describes, uh, in conjunction with that graph I showed earlier um, regarding the um, density and pressure of the Earth's atmosphere, basically describes why we're kind of capped at uh, a certain altitude because eventually this V that you need is so large um, that it's not possible to um, actually make a balloon that's that, that's that big. So I just want to take, talk about some uh, basic dynamics of the balloon. Um, uh, one of the dynamics is the thermal dynamics of the balloon. Um, the most basic uh, drawing here. So we have the sun um, radiating. Some of that is reflected. Let's say your balloon is white. And it'll reflect more, of course, um, of the thermal radiation, uh, or the sun's radiation. And then some of it is absorbed, of course. Um, so once again, like I, like I talked about in the um, thermal section, um, in the temperature section, um, the conduction is really bad um, at altitude. So let's say you have a component, like a motor or something that's really hot, um, and you're like, ah, you know, I just have this heat sink on here. It's going to you know, dissipate this heat. Well, that doesn't exactly work at altitude because of the, you know, low amount of particles that could actually wick off that uh, wick off that heat um, so you can't rely on that um, and then the other thing is like let's say you have a plastic component um, that works fine uh, down here on earth um, but its melting temperature is low enough or its uh, 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 its glass transition temperature uh, is low enough that it can, you know, begin to warp or something like that um, at altitude because it's getting hit by the sun, but it's not um, getting rid of that heat. So it's just building up and getting hotter and hotter until it uh, begins to um, deform. Um, 
the other thing is, is like all all things are always radiating energy, um, black body radiation. If you're familiar, um, basically anything with heat radiates, um, radiates photons. Um, and that's because that's just how uh, <laughs> physics and chemistry work. Um, so everything's always um, radiating photons. That's why thermal imaging works. Um, so that's one way that uh, the heat is getting removed. Um, and the only other way is conduction. So your options for dissipating the heat is are not great um, for either of those. So definitely um, keep thermal um, thermal things in mind. Um, that's not to say that everything's going to get super hot either. Um, things could uh, be allowed to soak in the uh, in the conduction, so they're going to um, they're going to actually reach the uh, temperature of the um, atmosphere around them, so they could get very cold. Uh, which is so it's a very interesting situation thermal situation we have uh, next I want to talk about vertical drag so we have once again the um, density increases um, as we go up or decreases as we go up so um, at the very beginning we have we have to push through a lot of air we have to move the air out of our way as we go up um, and then at least on this ascent profile here um, it's pretty linear because you're as your drag goes uh, goes down, um, your buoyancy also goes down, so it kind of cancels out, and you end up with this uh, straighter um, ascent profile. And then here is a cut down or burst, so it uh, the balloon is now in free fall under a parachute, and you can see as it hits the thicker atmosphere, it slows down more and more and more until it um, hits the ground, hopefully going at safe speed, uh, so that the components of the balloon are not damaged of the payload um so it, it this also limits like how fast you can basically go um which is, is a good thing um but the other much more aggravating thing is horizontal drags so the winds are always blowing um and they have different wind layers in the stratosphere and the troposphere and they blow all over um <laughs> and they blow our balloons very far away as well um so part of the uh, Part of one of the projects that's happening this summer is to um, predict where the balloons will land um, mid-flight. Um, and basically you can see that the balloon was launched here from Clarksville. I believe this is in Tennessee, yeah, it's Nashville. Um, it was launched, it went up to altitude, and then this balloon here is at the, it's actually at the highest point of the flight. Um, and that was actually the flight profile we just looked at before. And then the balloon was allowed to descend. So the winds were just constantly blowing um, to the east um, and just blew this balloon uh, just basically straight east um, with a little bit of westerly movement here at the very top. Um, so if this was a zero pressure balloon or something along those lines, if it was allowed to float at its top altitude, it could potentially come back this direction more. Um, so this could get a little more complicated. So basically the winds are always pushing the balloons, even when they're falling, free falling, um, and uh, when they're landing, um, basically determining where they land. So thank you for watching. Um, if you found this interesting uh, and want to see more of these videos as they come out, uh, go ahead and subscribe. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions uh, regarding the ballooning program just throw them down in the comments i will uh i will get to them thank you